Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we are talking about contractors or employees today. What's the best for your business? Um, so those of you who don't know me, if this is the first webinar you've been on with me, my name is Christelle Wren and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at HR Locker. Um, so today we are absolutely delighted to have Sharissa Raja with us from Element Global Services. So Sharissa is the Vice President Employment Law and Compliance. Um, so Sharissa, we're delighted to have you here with us today. Um, we recently did a podcast together, so uh, I always enjoy your company. So really looking forward to spending the next while having a chat about this subject. Um, so just to give everybody just a quick overview. So like I said, um, I'm Crystal Rain. I'm from HR Locker is the and we are a um, HR Locker is a cloud based uh, HR software service. So we help companies manage their employee data um, and kind of organize uh, the HR side of their of people's companies The we've been getting a lot of questions lately in regards to that big kind of question of um, after the Uber ruling, how does it affect my business? Should I be um, taking contractors on? Should I be changing them to employees? And that's one of the things that really kind of pushed us to do this. This topic was to kind of answer those um, those customer questions of ours. Um, so, Sharissa, sure, so if you want to just give a, a little bit of a background on yourself and Elements Global as well. <laughs> an HR services and technology company. Um, and at its core, we support global expansion for our clients in um, more than 135 countries. Um, in my team, certainly, we have nine regional employment lawyers who um, handle all the statutory compliance, registrations, employment agreements, life cycle changes, and terminations for the employees um, in respect of our clients' businesses. Super. So. Sure. So one of the um, things I suppose it's really topical at the moment, specifically after the Uber ruling um, is, you know, we all have this kind of question in regards to at the moment. Um, is it a bad thing that I have contractors? Are my employee are my contractors actually employees? So maybe if we kind of just start at the top of what are the basic differences between employees and contractors? Yeah, I think that's a really good place to start unpacking this. Um, I think I think that the fear of the unknown is fostering this kind of market anxiety that we're seeing. Um, and I think that the trends and laws between um, the lockdown last year to date um, has not exactly made um, for, for comfort to companies in relation to atypical engagement of persons in their workplaces. If I had to bring this down to three bullet points, yeah, it would be around economic dependence, um, integration and supervision and control. So in other words, is the person that you are engaging, maybe through an intermediary or directly, is that person economically dependent on you? Um, do they work only for you? Um, the, the service agreement, and we'll talk about that with the Uber judgment, is not the definitive factor in this. We're talking about the actual working relationship and working practice. The second point is integration. Now, employment law is very much substance over form. That's why I say park your best draft of contractor agreements aside and talk to me about your day to day practices. Is this person integrated into your company? You know, someone reached out to me on LinkedIn to say, can I have my contractor supervising subordinates who are my employees? And, and, and that in and of itself, as you say it out loud, sounds mm -hmm. jarring because that is integration. Um, and the final point is supervision and control. Are you are you overseeing the person's work? Does a person have to ask for permission not to come in today, to come in late, uh, to take annual leave? All these things are a species of contract of employment relationship terms, and they're not going to be in a service agreement, a normal standard service agreement. And, and that's what courts are looking for. And, and when we come to talk about the Uber judgment, we'll see how the courts uh, trumps those aspects of the relationship or impose them into the working agreement with Uber drivers and Uber. And I mean, so Shrisa, do you think at the core of it, I mean, uh, we're being pushed away, I think, from from the contractor element. But I mean, there for a lot of companies, um, there is a huge benefit for using contractors. Um, you know, 
is it a case of you know the main benefits between contractors and employees does one outweigh the other do you think i mean ultimately you'd want to i'd want to understand what is the business purpose you're trying to achieve so if you have a project based uh, based thing that's running you know um, it's got a fixed start date a fixed end date and you need a specific kind of skill um uh, that can entirely the function can entirely be outsourced to that skill to run the project. That's a contractor scenario. If you need to exercise those those three aspects, the, the economic dependence, the integration, supervision and control, then the question is, why are you so scared to go for a fixed term contract of employment? Mm -hmm. Would that serve your operational need for that short fixed term the same way and with less risk um, than a contractor scenario would? I, I personally am not scared to use contractors. I would be very careful of the line between a contractor and a worker where this is a the, the, where, where you, you have these elements that can crop into the relationship um, without you even realizing it's happening. Because mm -hmm. um, I definitely think, you know, the, we had a couple of um, customers on during the week and they have they're in the tech space, they're based in the UK and they are basic. They hire people in in terms of contracting wise, rather they contract people in um, for the skills that they don't need for certain periods. So if it's it's if it's, if it's for that specific two or three months that you just need that skill in, good. But if you've got somebody on contract for four or five years, basically in your company, not so good. Mm, exactly right. Um, because because the same can be said for a fixed term contract of employment. Yes. If you roll over and roll over, there's going to be that expectation of renewed employment. Yeah, and I mean, one of the, the the big questions, you know, in terms of in the UK, it, it's 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 got that IR thirty five kind of fear to it. <laughs> um, so, from a company perspective, what is my responsibility, and also how do I know if IR thirty five applies to my workers? Yeah, That's a million dollar question for you. <laughs> um, I think, bless the poor IR thirty five. <laughs> legislation has been around since um, 1999, I think, and it applied to public sector workers. And I think in April this year, it started applying to private sector employees. And 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 the biggest thing is the shift in onus to file. The client to whom you're providing the services will now file with HMRC, right? And l let me say this, the IR35 is a, is a tax law. And, and I think that that's really important. It's not an employment law, it's a tax law. So for tax purposes, if you are inside the IR35, then you will have to pay um, employment tax. So tax on income, national insurance contribution, right? If you are outside the IR35, then you don't have to pay those taxes. And it's intended to, to apply a, a level of parity uh, based on the true nature of the working relationship between the parties. Now, the tax laws are very binary. It's either they apply to you or they don't. The employ employment laws are very different. Now, the confusion was, well, if I'm found by HMRC or the client to be inside the IR35, am I then eligible for worker protections? So can I now start claiming my holiday pay, my uh, statutory sick pay, et cetera? How does this work? And we did see a case, um, the Susan Winchester case, um, the contractor that was providing services to HMRC, and she paid, uh, she was paid four thousand um, pounds in in a leave claim pursuant to being found um, pursuant to being inside the IR thirty five. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and the question is, are we going to start seeing more of those cases come out? But let's say you have this IR thirty five uh, filing to to do now. You make the filing. And the contract says, actually, no, 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 I, I believe that the way you've been handling me, I'm inside the IR35. And then as a consequence of that brings a claim against you saying, well, actually, I'm your worker. Maybe I'm your employee, etc. It's going to be a very high onus to prove because that onus will be on the contractor to say what happened between all of time up to April 2021 when that person was filing his or her own IR35, well, own tax to now that suddenly there's a change in heart of how, how they should be classified. And, 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 and I think that legislators are aware of or alive to the room for vexatious litigation or frivolous claims coming out of this. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a it's a big risk or that it's a risk that can't be quickly addressed and resolved. Um, but in saying that, 
you do want to be very clear about whether you are inside or outside the IR35 because it really is for tax purposes a mm -hmm. very binary task and you really should take tax advice on how you're using contractors, how you're managing them and, and the period of time they've been in your organization looking for integration, etc. And I think that's the key, Shrews, isn't it, is that companies and individuals, they just need to understand where they are, where they fit, get the, get the appropriate advice. Like you said, it is a tax uh, tax uh, tax um, sector, so make sure you get the appropriate advice and stick stick to that and understand where where you lie on it. Um, just I, I actually didn't mention this at the beginning. We do have a question and answer section. Um, it should be at the top right of your screen. And so, if anybody does have any questions um, for Sharissa, um or myself, please put them into the questions and answers um, section when we'll get them at the end. But we do enjoy making these as interactive as possible, so please put as many questions and answers in there. Um, and I do have the lovely Jenny at hand to be looking at those questions and passing them on. So sorry about that. Um, so yes, so so certainly I do think this IR35 um, side of it, certainly with our own customers and clients, they it, it seems to be this big black cloud at the moment that people are terrified of it. Um, whereas probably just the advice being just get the appropriate advice and just stick to 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 what the advice is that you're getting, um, which I think is key. So if we go back then, um, just take a step back then in terms of the actual contractors rights. Right. So in terms of we understand that we have direct employees who may be on fixed term contracts or part time contracts or or. But we do understand that they're that an employee is covered under specific employee legislation. So we understand notice periods and holidays and things like that. But if I'm just bringing a contractor in to work with me for 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 two months, um, it's on a specific job that I'm that I'm getting them to work with me. What actual rights does that contractor have? Should I be looking at annual leave and um, you know requirements? Should I be looking at kind of that that working time, how many hours they're working, uh, or is that my responsibility? So contractors have no rights in vis-a-vis -vis the uh, basic conditions of employment that will be conferred to employees, whether they're fixed term, permanent, um, project based, casual based workers, etc. The, the big the big uh, flag would be between employees and workers and in the worker category would be would be contractors who may likely now bring claims of worker status based on the Uber judgment. If you're dealing with a pure contractor, um, regardless of the IR35 status, their employment status is that they don't exist as employees in your organization. And what and there's some very practical tips that, that, that I, I, I look out for when when this comes to, to my desk is um, Simple things like, do they have an email address that doesn't distinguish them um, from your employees? Um, are they on your mailing groups? Do they are they part of the supervision and control line of reporting? Do they attend business meetings? Do they have business cards? Um, what about their access cards? You know, when we go back to the office one day, um, will they have that same picture, that same setup? Is there anything that that tells you from as a you know in law we talk about the reasonable bystander test, the officious bystander? It. A reasonable person from the outside looking in, will that person say, hey, sure, this is a contractor, she's not an employee? Or will they say, oh, yeah, that's true, so she's been there forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what her job is, but she's been there working with them for a long time. Um, because if they're saying the latter, then you're running the risk of uh, worker findings, maybe even employee status. Uh, we shouldn't only assume that people who are contracted with us can bring claims only for worker status under the Uber judgment. Nothing stops them from going the full Monty and saying, well, actually, I'm your employee and I want the, 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 the full Joe under the Employment Rights Act. Um, yeah, and I think that's what we're kind of seeing at the moment, Trish, isn't it? It's that contractor who has been working for a company for the last four years. They wear the uniform. They only work for that company. Um, they put in when they're on annual leave. They request annual leave and they're reporting to somebody in the con in the company. The lines are a little bit blurred there to understand is that person an actual contractor or an employee? Yeah, and, and when we're talking about these employment claims, right? If I if I was wanting to look at the IR35 status and, and if I wanted to bring a claim, uh, a reciprocal claim under employment law, I would say I would I, I would be very easily able now, certainly, to pierce that corporate bell because previously we assumed that um, if I was providing services to company A via Sharissa Raja Incorporated, 
um, and I was put, providing my personal services and, and you were doing all these things, supervising me, blah, 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 um, that you were protected because of the corporate identity of the arrangement. Um, the IR35 tells us that, that for tax rules, they don't care. They're going to pierce that because if you're providing personal services, then you must pay income tax and you must make NI contributions, right? If I then wanted to rely on those facts and bring them into the employment relationship, just because the IR35 indicators are for tax purposes, doesn't mean I can't use the same evidence for my employment law claim against you. And under employment law, there's a, there's a multifaceted approach. We're looking at worker claims, which would be a lower threshold to employment claims. And you are going to start seeing the myriad or the species of claims that are going to come through. But when do these things come through? When you give your employees a pay increase, when you pay out a bonus, when you confer a new benefit, when you terminate the contractor on notice. At any point when there's no quid pro quo for the contractor, you're going to start seeing this claim come through when they, when they believe that they're entitled to parity. Um, and that's why we need to be, you know, employee relations is, is best served proactively um, because on a reactionary basis, we start talking about mandates for settlement, um, not because of bad case, good case, because of business sensibility. Um, you know, that's the attitude I would approach this thing with. And Sharissa, obviously right now we're talking about, say, IR35 and that 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 applies to me as a as a UK as a UK company. But if I've got contractors based in other parts of of the world, being Europe or or further afield, and I have them on specific contracts, does that same legislation apply to those? So what you generally find is is national laws bind the state. Um, in terms of the greater Europe, what what you should be casting your eye on is the directive that's coming out that will bind all the uh, uh, nation's economies within the European Union. Um, that is going to regulate um, vulnerable or um, vulnerable and atypical employees um, in relation to how they work, the kind of protections that should be conferred on them. And that directive is supposed to be coming out later this year. Mm -hmm. Once the directive comes out, all countries within the European Union have a period of time to pass national laws to um, uh, implement and enable the, the principles of the directive within the, the borders of their country. Now, you're going to want to watch that. But if I think as a South African licensed lawyer, um, you know, if I think about before we had our Section 197 of the Labor Relations Act, right, we would we would refer to two key decisions out of the, the UK courts as 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 um, um, guiding us in what the outcome of our um, business acquisition um, employment claims should be. Now, sitting in the UK, if I wanted to bring a claim for employee status, I'm going to look to the global judgment in Spain where the, the, the riders were made employees. And I'm going to say, I see the Uber judgment, but that's different because of that whole contractual makeup. Mm -hmm. I'm going to claim for employment status and guiding you, I want to, my Lord, present to you the uh, facts in Globo, which are almost identical to mine. Um, we, there was a delivery case as well. Um, you're going to want to, to be careful about the persuasive cases coming out of courts recently. And there are a lot of them coming out right now, um, which does make anyone who's in support of the digital economy feel a little bit sad right now. <laughs> um, I just have two quick questions. I'm just gonna gonna throw in because I think we can answer these real quick, sure, if that's okay. It's, is we have one here is how can you explain hi, can you explain the economic dependence again? Um, so what do you mean by that? Um, it's best described as what I have on my husband. <laughs> <laughs> So economic dependence says that, um, and, and, and this can apply categorically across the Commonwealth. I mean, it says that if you, the, the contractor works mostly for you, right? Um, and if, and, and also in the contractor agreement, what we look for is if you have an exclusivity clause that says um, that the person must provide X amount of hours only to you. Um, the other thing around that that would create economic dependence is if you had a non-compete in the contractor agreement. Um, now, very often what I found in my time when I was still in practice even was that um, people would take their employment restraint, their best and most restrictive employment restraint, change the word employee to contractor and put it in the service agreement. Uh, and that in a contractor agreement, we're talking about a goodwill restraint, 
not an employment restraint, which has a different um, reciprocal rights and obligations between the parties. But those are the things that would confer economic dependence. If A, I have to work 40 hours for you, well, where do you want me to work? What, what's left? In the Secondly, if I, I work so much for you, uh, so many hours for you, that I really can't work for anyone else. And if you restrain me from working for anyone else in the sector, in the industry, um, the best one I found was where a contractor agreement and, 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 and the person said, this is a contractor, you know, I don't see any risk, but because you're nagging, I'm going to mail it to you, have a look, you're probably going to find that you've wasted your time. Okay, I won't even charge you for it, send it over to me, I want to see it. And it was there was just something about it, you know, in employment law after after a couple uh, decades in you, if it starts smelling like 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 a like a two P, like a contractor, like an employee, you kind of trust your government. And what we found there was the duty of good faith, the duty not to compete, and alas, the duty to devote the whole of your time, fiduciary duties that you have in the employment relationship as warranties in the service agreement. Now those things would impute. Um, economic dependence because the person can only work for you. You've set it up that way. But that's not to say that we would only be confined to the contractor agreement. We would look through the evidence and remember um, employment laws on a balance of probability. So if this person was providing you with timesheet and raising an invoice, we'd start counting the hours on the timesheet and get an approximation over a three month period to figure out how many hours he or she provided services, as you'd like to call it, to you. Um, that that's what we look at the factual matrix matrix. That's why I say it's not as binary as the tax law. It's very multifaceted and 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 just about anything within that relationship can be brought in to adduce evidence for this. So it's even if somebody's working for somebody else, if they've got any other time, they're working for four or five hours with another company, that probably dilutes the economic dependence. But if somebody's working a hundred percent for you, you have in their contract they cannot work for anybody else, that kind of economic de dependence gets a little bit blurry then because they are basically 100% dependent on you. The next question I have there is, um, is what's in relation to IR35? Is this, is IR35 purely just HRMC um, or does it pertain at all to the Irish revenue side of it, the Republic? I'm not sure about that. I'll have I'll have to double check your Irish laws and come back to you. Um, I can, I can sit later response via Jenny and yourself. Um, also. Yeah. Yeah, and we can get it. We can get a question on, on that, um, which is super. So um, I great. So we'll just move on to the next slide. Sorry, I thought I just had another question there. Um, so all the talk have been, I think this is I think this is the underlying reason why people are terrified at the moment. <laughs> and we've had some great chats about the, the Uber ruling. What does it mean? And I think that my personal opinion is that people just have no idea what does it mean to them, right? So when we're thinking of the Uber ruling, we think of, OK, so does this only is, is this if I have drivers or, you know, does this really only affect kind of Uber and Deliveroo and those kind of services? But then if I'm in the tech space or the NGO space, I also have contractors. So should I be concerned about this as well if I have if I'm in other industries? I would say, yeah. I, the, 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 the principles of this case apply across sectors and industries. We're not just looking at uh, fintech or, um, uh, you know, where, where you have drivers or riders or we're talking about contractors who can bring a claim for worker status, regardless of whether there's an intermediary between the two of you, whether you, you have no company here and you've got some service company here and your whole co is sitting in the Netherlands like Uber was, etc. The principles of the case are, are binding on all of us right now. Um, and I would I would say that we should be looking to very much to how we guard against risk materializing. Um, and we can talk to the kind of practical things that, that 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 we can steps we can take to address that proactively. But what is the Uber ruling now? The Uber judgment came out because Mr. Aslam and 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 uh, a number of other claimants wanted to bring a test case. So there were a lot of Uber drivers who were very unhappy about all of this, but they brought a test case. Now, when we as lawyers bring a test case, that means we say we're going to take the case with our best facts. We're going to bring it forward and all the others we agree in principle will uh, be bound by the outcome of that decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he brings a claim in the employment tribunal and he's successful. Uber takes this uh, on appeal. 
it goes up to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And then in the SCA, Uber argues about how the, the setup is. Now, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the setup, but they put a lot of evidence before the judges to say, you know, this is how we are set up. So Uber BB sits in the Netherlands. The service company sits in the UK. That is not the, the contracting party to the relationship. The relationship is the contractual relationship is with Uber BB in the Netherlands. OK, and your contract is sitting here in, in the UK. Now, let's say you have a driver only. That person only drives for you. They they you can have a fleet partner, someone who owns a lot of cars and they have drivers via that. Or you can have a person who has a single car or you can have a person who drives and doesn't even own that car. OK, that is that is contracted between those parties, the fleet partner, the Uber driver, all, all of them are contracted outside of the com commercial relationship with Uber BB. Uber BB has no visibility on that. They just get the facts of, of who's driving when, how, and what get put, gets put up onto the platform. Now, this whole thing is a platform economy, right? Um, the riders, however, argued, and this is what the judge said, that when the riders log on to the app, right, they're, they're not told to accept trips, decline trips, blah, blah, blah. They can elect to, to do so. But if they're inactive for a period of time, they can be logged out, okay? The other thing is, whilst they, might, they may not, uh, be told how many trips to accept or reject in a day, the service levels are monitored. So if they got ratings of below a certain amount, um, that would impact their the, the fee that's paid to them. The other thing is that uh, Uber sets the fee that is paid to them. They, they, they have no negotiating power. This is not like you and me sitting across the table saying, yeah, Christelle, you know, I, I don't know if that's equitable. Can we rather talk, talk about a 20% bump up? Et There's no bargaining power like that. Uber, like, you know, as an employer sets the, the job grade and I say, OK, I either accept it or I go find a job elsewhere. You know, it, it, that's what the, the inference is. Um, based on all of these things, the court says you, my friend Uber, are exercising supervision and control. Uh, you have made these people economically dependent on you. You know, they're logging in. You're watching their activity. You're watching their ratings. You're watching their, their um, uh, service levels and you're setting their salary accordingly. If you want to come here and tell me that the contract is set up like this, and you know, you sit here, I sit here, they're like, we don't care. We're not bound to the terms of the contract. We're here to confer um, equity in the employment relationship. And we see this as, as one where the drivers are actually and should be workers. Um, that was the core of that case. Now, that, that part is important. There were two things there. The judge was expressly clear and says, we will not busy ourselves or distract ourselves with just the contractual terms. So don't come here and tell me about the contract. Talk to me about what you're doing physically. The second thing that that's of relevance there is that Mr. Aslam and, and the other claimants only claimed worker status. They never said, I want to claim I am an employee. So we don't know if this can evolve or whether this can dilute. What, what we knew, do know is that Mr. Aslam brought a claim for worker status, as did his colleagues, and now Uber is busy converting all their drivers to, to workers. If we bring all that back and say, OK, that's a cool summary. Thanks so much. What does that mean? Um, ultimately, when someone is a worker, it's, they're still not an employee. Now, that means that there are a, a, a certain set of rights and protections that are conferred to them under the Employment Rights Act that they would not have any access to as a pure contractor. Now, the first thing is national minimum wage, which means you have to track that. The second thing is unlawful deductions from that uh, minimum wage. Um, the other thing and the big thing is paid holiday. I mean, imagine these guys and the extent to which they would be eligible to, to get back pay for holiday pay for the full period. Um, also, um, working time, you, they, they fall within those protections. Protection against unlawful discrimination is important. Um, and, and I think that's where we, we will likely see litigation coming up from, from this uh, going forward as well. Uh, whistleblowing laws um, and then the statutory sick pays. Now that's uh, SSP, uh, maternity, uh, paternity, statutory adoption and shared parental pay, all those things that are legislated where they can claim pay from the government. Now, what they wouldn't get is protection from unlawful dismissal, sorry, unfair dismissal, 
um, time off for emergencies, flexible working, and the redundancy pay if you had to make them redundant later on. Those would be the things that are that are reserved for employees only. Um, and, and that's really what the Uber judgment means for you, that these are the implications if you're dealing with someone who actually could bring a claim successfully so as a worker uh, vis-a-vis um, as a contractor in your business. And, and, and the point to note is that this would apply with effect from day one of when your practices change, if your practices were always like that, then it would be retrospective to the commencement date of, of the uh, uh, service agreement with, with yourselves. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things you mentioned earlier is obviously the the Uber ruling in terms of it's it's affecting UK legislation at the moment. But the the truth of the matter is that that it's it we're going to be looking every other country within the EU is looking at it as well, right? So um, it's it's or not even within the EU, kind of globally, are, are going to be looking at this and how it's how it's going to affect every every country. I, th I think long term. Um, so the UK were really just the first to kind of move on it. Um, but I, I just want to go back to to a few questions I, I have just to kind of confirm things with people is um, that in terms of IR35. So today we're, we're, we're going through the UK legislation and UK and, and how contractors are dealt with in the UK. And if, for example, you're hiring somebody outside of not hiring, contracting somebody outside <laughs> outside of the UK, for example, um, the ROI or outside it within within the EU or, or further afield. And how does the legislation affect that? And to that point, sure, so there's actually a very good question that's come in is if a contractor looks and feels like an employee. Um, so you've got that 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 if you know there maybe could be have people reporting to them um, and you know wearing the uniform, that kind of thing. But they're not based in the UK. Uh, do they have any employee rights and are there any ramifications to the company? Um, it depends where they sit and what the laws are. Um, I would I would certainly think that there's always a risk depending on, on, on the jurisdiction you're in. There are very few jurisdictions where I would say, ah, take your chances. Um, I mean, if I think about Europe in large, You've got you've got Commonwealth Europe and continental Europe and continental Europe just regulates what we we as Commonwealth lawyers know as our, our, our basic uh, common law duties and, and responsibilities. So I don't I don't think that you are safe in the scenario, particularly considering what Europe is busy doing right now. If you think about the directive, you know, Priscilla, you spoke about the UK being the first to bring out the case. Spain is busy with the legislation of its own. They're not waiting for the EU directive. They're, they're proactively dealing with this. And it comes out of the global judgment, which was in October 2019 High Court case. Mm -hmm. um, so Spain's already busy with that. Um, in Ireland, you guys have been actively uh, watching the remote working economy, which I think is, is a step away from now looking to gig working, digital economy, contracting economy. Um, Australia has been very busy with this as well. There's all kinds of um, plenaries, papers informing the legislature to bring law into play. Um, I know that the law firm that represented Mr. Aslam and the claimants are also going to be representing the Uber drivers in South Africa. So what I certainly see is the, the Commonwealth is, is certainly very, very busy with this because our laws are, are very, very similar. Um, and I would think that if you have people in continental Europe who are in these atypical engagements, then you're looking not at common law duties. You're, you're rather looking at the legislation that you're going to get caught up in. Um, in addition to that, remember that tax laws have their own suite, but it certainly is persuasive in an employment law tribunal. Um, one such thing is um, the 183 day tax rule, you know, and permanent establishment risk. That, that needs to be clarified. We, we need to figure that out. Um, and if you have people sitting in other parts of the world, what stops them from bringing claims in both jurisdictions, the, the, the jurisdiction of the commercial agreement with you and the jurisdiction where they are domiciled? Um, so you could have double employment law claims or worker status claims, depending on where you are, um, against you as a consequence of poorly managing this relationship. Yeah, and I think that actually the next question, um, Shrissa, probably is, is relevant to this as well, is that 
if the contractor is outside of the UK but provides services to the UK entity? And I know your question is going to be, your answer to that is going to be, it depends on, on the law within the, that the person resides in, doesn't it? And to your point is that you are opening yourself up to be brought to court in two countries, right? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think we know from, from all court cases in employment tribunals, you know, we, there was a constitutional court case in South Africa and, and, and the judges said, we're not here to listen to what, what the lawyers think is the true nature of the dispute. That's our job to determine the true nature of the dispute. Um, and when I talk about on a balance of probability, that, that is very important because very often people assume that your onus is this criminal law onus, beyond reasonable doubt. As employment lawyers, we're a little bit more relaxed than that. You know, we're a fun group. So, so the way we interpret the law is on a balance of probability. So in other words, what is the most reasonable inference you can draw from the set of facts that have been placed before you? And if they're contradictory, we're going to look for corroboration in the, the relationship. We're going to look for corroboration in what other people think. And that's where the officious bystander test comes in. Um, the multifaceted approach will only be persuasive where there's there's such overwhelming evidence that to infer otherwise would be plain um, absurdity. Um, and remember, all these, these, these murmurs and moves in, in legislation that we're seeing across Ireland, UK, um, uh, Spain, ultimately laws react to the movement of people. It can never be proactive because it can't preempt, you know. Um, so you're going to start seeing a lot coming out now because we've all been in lockdown and they've been watching us and now they're going to come out together and, and set up what they see as the areas for vulnerability and exploitation. And I think as you look through your global expansion, where you're doing business, maybe you just have a contractor here and there, you want to understand what the socioeconomic paradigms are of that territory in order to understand how legislation may move to impact you, either adversely or beneficially. Um, if I think back to South Africa, your, your, your people who get the most protection, those who are under the earning threshold of uh, 17,000 South African rands a month, right? If I think in the UK, I'm looking at not an earning threshold, but I'm looking at categories of people in certain um, ways of working. So in other words, contractors, workers, and gigas right now. The next category I would start looking to are those working remotely and, and I'd start looking to health and safety laws, um, mental wellness and, and fatigue, because we've seen a lot of movement coming out there as well. That as a holistic picture for the UK certainly is what I see as would be top of my agenda. Um, so I, I think that whilst, you know, all the agility is amazing and I am a huge supporter of it, I think we need to be cautious in how we implement the agility until the law is settled. Yeah, but I, I'm wondering, and I suppose this is where um, I kind of struggle to, I'm going to flip to the next slide quickly because I think it, it we'll, we'll go into this, is, but this is where I, I struggle to to match the what the Uber rule Uber ruling has done, which I, I I do agree with and 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 think that there is merit there for it. But how do you you match that with uh, contractors, say, for example, in the tech space or even in the NGO space who are getting paid really well and, you know, who want to be cont contractors and they don't want to work, uh, they don't want to be employees and they're happy to file in their own taxes. How do you marry the two between those people who are being taken advantage of and others who are professionals who, who want to be contractors? And, and, th and that's, that's the conundrum of the gig economy right now. Giggers all around the world are saying, why, you know, why are you troubling us? We're happy, we're minding our own business and we're getting on with it. Um, my, my big thing about the gig economy is that it allows a voice at the table, economic parity for uh, people to manage their lives because ultimately we don't live to work, we work so we can live. And it brings another uh, stronger sector to the economy, an entrepreneurial sector that we also desperately need, you know. But the reality is that the people who are worthy and need protection are those that cannot bargain for themselves. And in countries where there are no collective bargaining, where there are no strong employee relations laws to give those people a voice, they're going to go unheard and you're going to have 
massive socioeconomic disparity. So how do you manage that? Well, the person who might get caught by the IR35 would need to be reviewed and would need to come into the confines of an employment relationship if he or she is actually uh, integrated, economically dependent, and subject to a subordinate employment relationship. Because that's where the government says, well, my friend, you've enjoyed the benefits of this amazing uh, tax threshold, and I'm, I'm, you know, I wish you well, but you unfortunately have to contribute to NI and pay employee tax. Um, and in that scenario, it does not matter whether you have an intermediary between you and the person. If the person is providing services, doesn't have the right of substitution, doesn't carry financial risk um, in relation to the works, as we're supposed to be defining them as the works, the services, <laughs> you know, that, then the person's going to get caught out in that. And then and if the person is inside the IR35, the question is, why are you not employing this person? Like, why do you think? Because at some point when you terminate, the person said, actually, I mean, not in, you're not entitled to unlawfully terminate me. Um, and at that point, you will see um, the, the risk materialize. Because for as long as it works for the, the person, you know, we're all happy. Yeah. Then you see the risk. Um, I actually have an, another good question here, which which is kind of interlinks with that is, do you think there will be legislation to eventually describe worker status as it currently seems very subjective, which I think as uh, you've covered it very, it's very hard to explain what is a worker to a colleague. So we work with a fleet of self-employed drivers. So Uber case very relevant to us. Any suggestions how to advise what worker status is? Yeah. I think that you would want to look at the way in which you're handling them because a worker, a worker status would ultimately be the criteria for contractor to worker. So the economic dependence, the supervision and control and the uh, um, the right of subordination, right? You'd want to understand, I'd want to understand how your, your fleet are providing these services to you, how you set the service levels, um, and how you pay them for their time. Um, because you you don't just run the risk of the worker status, like in the Uber case, you could run the risk of employee status. Um, and, 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 and in terms of the determination, it is loose and low, I agree. Um, but in terms of whether you fall within the trappings of it, would really need to be looked at on on the ground, watching how you work and um, how you handle these people. But I take it one step further. I'd want to understand what their expectations are. Um, are you on a contract where you confer exclusivity to them? Uh, minimum, maximum hours? Um, do they have rest periods? Um, you know, there are things you might do that you might think, you know, it's, it's a goodwill gesture that you want to confer to them. Uh, maybe some downtime, maybe a bonus at Christmas. Yeah, because you gave your employees a bonus. Oh, let me just, you know, um, give them a bonus. Let's have a Christmas party. Just one big office Christmas party. All these things, this integration starts uh, marrying itself into a union. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, whilst you might not have a concise definition, of what is a worker vis-a-vis -vis an employee vis-a-vis -a, -vis a contractor. You know now what the criteria are, both in tax and employment law, that, that judges would consider persuasive. Um, so you'd want to look for how objectively evidence would be adduced to prove or disprove that in your relationship. Yeah, and I think it, <clears throat> it probably really comes down to then that economic dependence as well. You know exactly what you said is so I think and just a, probably a good time to say that um, uh, we'll have some contact details at the end for um, Sandra Harsh, who's with um, Elements Global <clears throat> Services, just that you guys are offering a, a free consultation for people just to discuss those those kinds of things. Um, we'll send these slides out anyway, but I definitely think for um, for companies in that situation, I don't know, sure, so do you agree, is that you need to step back and think, OK, so yes, it's a very loose um, description of what of what worker status, status is. But if I'm looking at these drivers right now, are they economically dependent on me? Do I um, 
do I restrict them um, in terms of who they can work for? Um, like you said, small things, maybe they didn't come to the office party this year, but the previous year, pre-COVID, did they come to the office party then? Are they wearing the uniform? Um, and then you're getting on shaky ground, right? To a lot of the um, the the kind of the rulings that I've seen recently, it 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 does seem to be really going in favour of the the worker, um, you know. And and my please correct me if I'm wrong, sure is there doesn't seem to be a um, it, that it only goes back two or three years. It goes back. Um, there's no limit on how far how far the ruling goes back in terms of what you owe the the what you, what you'll ultimately owe the now employee of yours, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I did have a chuckle about the Susan Winchester case mm -hmm. where she was providing services through an intermediary, her own company, uh, to the HMRC, and she was awarded four thousand pounds in 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 in, in um, back paid leave um, as a consequence of being found to be inside the IR thirty five. Uh, and I just thought, ha ha, bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I I I I do think that it, it is very pro employee. It is very pro. Um, a very conservative view, um, and, I, and I thought that just pre-COVID, you know, we, the law was being very robust. Um, I liked that, that, you know, in employment law, someone asked me the other day what I thought the three most important characteristics for an employment lawyer dispensing advice would be, and I said the most important one would be to be pragmatic, because we can never, we should never interpret law to lead to absurdity, uh, commercial absurdity. Um, and I, I do hope that once things settle and we're clear on where we stand this year, uh, post the EU directive, etc., that that we will we will we will have an objective lens to all of this. But you know, maybe running a large scale redundancy right now and talking only to your employees and ignoring your contractors when you engage your workplace counsel might be a little bit risky, um, even for my comfort level. So yeah. <laughs> so I mean. The we, we go back and this really is I'm throwing everything at, at, at you now is we've got part time workers we've full time workers we've contractors we have um, so remote workers flexible working how do I ensure I am compliant with the regulation you've got top two tips on how I make sure that I'm at least staying on top of it I think that your workplace strategy you need to accept it for what it is and it's fluid. They, you cannot right now say, oh, Christelle, hand the Bible, we're going to have this hybrid strategy. Charissa comes in here, her team comes in these days a week, this is how we do it, da 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 da, -da. You, you have to accept the reality that right now you're on a surfboard in this big fat wave and <laughs> you're going to crash into a rock or just, you know, you're just treading along, right? If you accept that, then the question is, well, in this fluidity, um, what are the business needs? Now, we used to say that we will set our business standard and employees can either work for us or go away, right? Um, we would say that we would serve our customers. This is how we serve our customers. What, what we're seeing is that right now, Customers want to work with, with service providers who believe in the same things as them, where they have a like-mindedness, where they can relate on a human level. So that influences the strategy and the fluidity that you would need to implement. The second thing is you're seeing right now a war for talent. Like, make no mistake that with the work from anywhere approach, um, you can get the best of the best skill if you have an employee value proposition that supports that, right? So if you don't catch up with that and exploit that for what it is, you're going to lose out and lose your market edge. Certainly in my role at Elements, I, you know, I was, I was in South Africa, I was in practice for like 16 years of my career. So I joined the company in lockdown. And my experience was I joined Elements, I'm onboarded remotely. Um, my team, um, the um, the general counsel and I at that time um, recruited for the employment law team all remotely. Um, and it's been a year now um, and I lead a team, nine people, all distributed remotely. Uh, some work in office locations, others don't. We've never met each other face to face. We only see each other here to here. That's all we know. Right? And we've had to build 
team spirit, camaraderie, trust, good faith, things that are implicit in the employment relationship, right? That you would get out of the handshake. I now have to get from like this centimeter viewing, you know, and what you need to figure out is what is your value proposition? How do you attract talent? But the most important thing is how do you retain that kind of talent at the pace at which you're now required if you haven't already been moving at, right? And then look at whether the benefits of a distributed, globally distributed workplace suit you. So in other words, do you need that level of diversity? Are you expanding that you need to understand the lay of the ground? You know, do you need that 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 transformation, diversity, et cetera? And I'm not just talking about, oh, I go hire some women, you know. Uh, no, I mean true diversity, different cultures, different uh, perspectives, paradigms that you would bring into your workplace. And even if you think that you need all of that, the next question is, well, how do you put it all together to make it work for you? So how do you how do you how do you remain compliant and how, what are your top tips? Accept the fluidity, accept the transitional period and the people you hire must equally reciprocate that commitment. Uh, yeah, and I wish I wish thoroughly agree with that is even for ourselves here at HR Locker, we've hired 22 people since January and again all remotely never met them and it is different it's 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 a different way of doing it we've always had a remote um team but you know there's 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 systems in place uh, to you know to shamelessly say so you know we obviously use our own system to make sure that you you're able to still have that great onboarding um process and it's probably just a little bit different but you do actually need to it's still as important it's even more important because nothing is happening, um, you know, just by chance that you're just meeting people outside. You actually have to make sure that that, that inclusion and that um, that uh, um, I suppose team spirit is actually cultivated. Which brings me very nicely into my last question that I have here. Couldn't have planned this better myself. So thank you for whoever posed this question. Is there the issue? So if you're not inviting people to your Christmas party and things like that. Is there then the issue of exclusion to contractors if they're not invited to office party gatherings? And how do we combat combat that? Yeah, that, that's a that's a workplace morale issue, certainly. Um, mm. Because if you think about it, if I was a worker, I could bring a claim for unlawful discrimination, right? Uh, but if I'm a contractor, I have no protections, and then you're going to have a, a workplace morale issue because where everybody works as a synchronized team. I've got one person who isn't involved, right? So, yeah. And it's going to be the minority of your workplace. They're going to be, they're either going to be a, a service that's not really truly integrated, that you don't really, you know, the reason it's a non-core function is exactly that. Um, so, so you, you'd want to, you'd want to, you'd want to find a way to build a proposition that is inclusive. Yeah. No, and that, that I definitely, it's a, it's, it's a difficult way to do it, but it's really how you manage it, isn't it? It's it's hard. Um, so look, guys, we're almost at the hour, so um, I think we'll wrap it up there. And thank you so much, everybody, for the questions. And Sharissa, you've been super. Um, and just to, uh, you know, for anybody who's looking for either, uh, you know, just any kind of information, please feel free to reach out to, to myself or um, to Sharissa or Sandra's details up there as well from, from elements, um, but it's been so wonderful speaking to you. And I do think this area is going to, it's just the start of it, right? I mean, we're going to see more and more legislation coming in and not even legislation, but more uh, court cases and things like that. Um, but for anybody who is maybe, you know, we have a lot of free documents and free downloads and things like that. So please go to HR Locker and you can have a look at look at that stuff there and 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 down, download there. And for anybody who just wants to get in contact, if you contact, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop them to to myself or Sharissa Bitcher. So as always, I could have spent another hour speaking to you. So thank you so much. And hopefully everybody found this useful. Um, my last thing, just because I've had a couple of questions there from people, is that we did run this webinar last month in regards to specifically for Republic of Ireland legislation as well in terms of contractors. So if somebody, um, if people are looking for a copy of that, Jim, we might just put that in the, the email as well to people just to make sure um, that they have that as well. And in the email, I'm just getting a gentle nudge here from Jenny to make sure I don't forget. <laughs> 
Sharissa, you forgot this too, is there will be a free white paper, um, a new era of international expansion and managing a global workforce that will be um, part of. So we'll send a copy of this webinar as well as a copy of that white paper to everybody as well um, who who was on the, the, um, the webinar. So thank you uh, so much. Um, and two questions there. Will this be recorded? Yes, it is. And can we listen to it again? Absolutely. We will send you on the link um, probably kind of tomorrow ish or so. But thank you, Sharissa. You've been wonderful again. So take care, everybody. And really looking forward to talking to you all soon.